So during these meetings, uh, we purpose to speak the gospel message. It's good news each night. And we thought, well, we'll take up some of the words that we find in the good news of God's salvation. And, and these words, uh, they, they range um, the, the whole dictionary. Uh, and, and the spectrum is great. But sometimes these words seem to be uh, at odds with one another. And yet the gospel is able to bring them together to show us uh, how these words coalesce. They come together uh, in this message. And tonight we're going to take up um, some well-used words in the Bible, the, the, the idea of light and darkness. It's my um, obligation tonight to speak on darkness. And if you stay tuned for the second half of the meeting, it's only half an hour. Uh, Matt, uh, the second speaker, Matt Hebert, he's going to speak on the word light in Scripture. So I want to read one verse with you. If you have a Bible, you could turn to it. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, well-known verse written here to uh, believers, written from the pen of the Apostle Paul. We're going to read them together. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 says this, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We'll read it one more time. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Those are great words that we've read there about light and darkness. I want to focus just a little bit on darkness this evening and speak about it, because if we can see the significance of darkness we will so appreciate the idea of light and light coming into this world. And so we're going to see that. I was, I was reminded uh, by someone recently. I live in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the state that you can thank us later brought you the light bulb because we also gave residence to the man who invented the light bulb uh, well over uh, 140 years ago. But there's a light bulb in Evermore, California, that has been burning without being turned off since 1901. Significant. Almost 119 years, this light bulb has never gone out, never been shut off. And you say, that's that's amazing. I, I wondered, where were these light bulbs when I was searching for the ones that I seem to be replacing every three months? But, you know, uh, someone did an interview in Evermore, California, and the residents, they said there, they said, you know, sometimes you forget that it's even on. It's been on so long, you forget that it's even still shining because it's just been there and it's been on for over a century. You forget that it's even on. You know, when we come to the news about Jesus Christ, so many, so many of us, we're, we're attending churches. So many of us are trying to, to do our best, even in days like this that seem to be uh, full of, of anger and violence and malice. And we're trying to put our best foot forward, doing our best uh, as family members in the workplace. And, and, and whether it's going to a church, being part of a charity, we forget this. We forget all about Jesus Christ. And I ask you tonight, as I would ask anybody who's listening, your hope of being, as the Bible could say, in the place where there's no need for a sun, no need for a sun to shine, because there is light there that can never be extinguished. Have you forgotten that the light that shined in this world to dispel all the darkness of evil was Jesus Christ and him alone? Your faith must depend on him and nothing else. Anything added to that is though we, we forget sometimes that Christ shined in this world and we've sought other ways in which to please God other than his son. I, I think of that light bulb that's been shining for 119 years. I sometimes think we forget that it's still on. Christ is still able to save your soul if only you would believe that when he died, he died for you. The Bible tells us that. We're going to look at some darknesses in scripture, in the Bible, that are so significant and tell us something that can have serious meaning for us in this life. And that's going to be significant tonight as we talk about God. Because remember what the Bible says about God in 1 John. It tells us this, that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. No darkness whatsoever. There, there, here we have a God that we serve. And in him is no darkness, no sin, no wickedness, nothing that could ever take away from his light. When we look at the Bible, sometimes we think of light and darkness, and we're wondering, what, what does the Bible mean by that? 
Is it just using figurative language? Well, in the Bible, when light is used of God, darkness is used of everything that is anti-God. In fact, the Bible, in, in a number of ways, speaks about wickedness and speaks about sin, speaks about hell, uh, speaks about these things that, that are all against God as being darkness. And so significantly, we're going to see that drawn out here in the Bible. I think of darkness on the first page of our Bible. If you're ever to open your Bible and just to start reading, maybe even in a reading plan, which we would recommend highly to read through the Bible, you know, you only get to page one. And you go through page one of your Bible and say, I wonder what causes God to speak for the first time? What causes him to open his mouth? Why does God ever speak in the first place? You'll read only a couple of verses down about darkness being over the face of the earth. And God speaks for the first time, and he says, let there be light. God speaks in order to get rid of darkness. The first time he speaks, so significant, and so significant that the, the writer there in Genesis, Moses, as he records these things, he, he talks about the face, almost the face of this creation being dark, no one being able to see it. And here God speaks and illuminates the beauty of the face of his creation. And he does so that everyone can marvel at what he had made. You know, our verse tells us that too, that the same God who caused the light to shine out of darkness, that he reveals the face, he reveals who he is, in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. I think that's a great connection there. But we read here, just on the first page of our Bible, of a God who speaks in order to get rid of darkness that was in this world, that covered the face of his creation. You fast forward 2,000 years, 2,000, 4,000 years, you fast forward actually. And you know, you start reading in your New Testament. Maybe you open to the book of Matthew, and there you read about a people that sat in darkness, that sat in darkness, that, that we had ruined this creation, that the God who caused the light to shine, that we, we ignored all that he wanted, all that he thought was good. We destroyed what he had. We, we sinned. We rebelled. We, we didn't want anything to do with him. And we caused darkness not only to exist in this world and in our societies, but in our hearts. And the Bible tells me, as I open to those first pages of the New Testament, that there we were sitting in darkness. And yet God, once again, what does he do? He sends his son. You go to the Gospel of John there. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the final communication to mankind. That God finally spoke in his son. Why? To dispel darkness. To get rid of evil, sin, uh, all the things that plague humanity, all the things that cause us tears and shame and sorrow all the things that cause scratches on the soul is what god sent his son into this world in fact the bible says in john 1 and 5 that the light his son shined in darkness and the darkness could not overcome it here was a man who shined in this world and sin could not overcome him how significant because the bible tells me if you read the most famous verse in the bible john 3 and 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you go just a couple of verses after that, you know what you read? Light came into this world, but men love darkness more than they love light because their deeds were evil. You reflect on your own heart. Is that true of you? You would say, I don't know. I, you, you, you look inside and say, you know, my actions, uh, my, my my actions, if, if others were to know them, would they look at me the same way? Because it says here that men love darkness more than they love light, that Christ came into the world and we would have preferred had he not come. That because he came, we knew we had a problem. We knew we had an issue. And the Bible tells us that. And we wonder sometimes the cost, the cost of getting rid of darkness, getting rid of sin. What does it cost? Does it, does it take a pilgrimage? That does the cost of getting rid of sin just, just mean that you attend church 50 out of 52 weeks in the year? Well, in 2020, you're done. You have no chance. Does the cost of getting rid of darkness, of sin and wickedness, does it, is it going to take some government? Is it going to take some amount of money? I always I think of my father, who uh, probably everybody's father used to tell them about turning their lights off. Turn off the lights. I was always told as a kid growing up. And 
I was I was so convinced that keeping a light bulb on in the house must have cost my dad a good couple hundred dollars a day by the amount of force in which he told us to turn the lights off. Um, it wasn't until I think my ninth grade teacher told me it was only 14 cents a day to keep the light bulb on that I then wondered what a, what a cheap cost to keep light on. What a, what, a, what a small fraction. I guess at that point I wasn't making any money, so it didn't matter. But the cost of keeping, the cost of taking your sin away wasn't the flick of a switch. It was the giving of a son. He had to die. The Bible tells us the son of God, he loved me. He gave himself for me. The Bible tells me that the light of this world was Jesus Christ. And never did he shine any brighter than when he was crucified in darkness. It's one of those rare aspects that we forget about. That at Calvary, on that Friday afternoon, from 12 noon until 3 p.m., darkness covered the face of this globe. Why? Because the sun was shining in all its brilliance. You need know, know, know nothing more about Jesus Christ than this, that he loved you enough to die for your sinful soul. You could believe that. God communicated in creation and dispelled darkness. He communicated to a sinful world, and he got rid of darkness. He was able to conquer sin because of his son being crucified. You fast forward another 2,000 years, and you come down right to today, 2020. The Bible tells us this. When it comes to my soul, the darkness in my soul, we read that verse and said, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I ask you, every single one of us were born in darkness. Every single one of us came into this world. The Bible tells me that. Born in sin, shaped, shaped by iniquity. Born in sin, shaped by iniquity. Born in darkness, shaped by it. I ask you this. Do you have a time in your life where you realize the Bible calls the gospel message the light of the glorious gospel? The light of the glorious gospel. You say, what is the gospel? The gospel message is just this, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Bible. You see... The most significant inventions, people say, from the past 500 years have interchangeably been one of two things, the printing press or the light bulb. And I tell you this, they are brought together beautifully because you could, you could easily live through life without either one, probably, and still have some satisfaction. But I tell you this, you can never be in God's eternity. You can never be in heaven without knowing this, that light has shined. It is printed on these pages for you to read, for you to believe that the same God who spoke in creation with light, the same God who spoke through his son to dispel the darkness that humanity had brought in, he still speaks to souls. And he speaks through his word. You could believe what the scriptures say, that I am a sinner. I, I love darkness more than light. But that Christ and the Lord Jesus said this. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The light of the world said that. And he's the one who took my place, was crucified in darkness in order that I could live. The word of God, this brilliant light, I ask you, satisfaction is found in no one else than this man, Jesus Christ. What he did is unparalleled. In fact, to try to do something in our lives to, to, to earn God's favor. Uh, one person has said it's like fireflies competing with the sun. You say there's no comparison. What I offer to God is nothing because God offered everything when he offered the light. The light of eternity came into this dark world and shined and shined so bright when he was crucified at Calvary and he died for sinners, died for your sins. You could believe that because it is written on these pages and you could see that God has spoken creation but he spoke at the cross and he would speak tonight if only you would listen and realize that you need this savior you need this light might you trust him as you listen to matt tell us more about this light thanks dave uh, we're going to read a verse tonight as we look at the light uh, and the verse uh, that we're going to read is in first john and chapter one and it says in verse five 
And what I'm reading from is a Bible, just like perhaps you have here at home. But First John for, uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And really that's what we're going to focus on here. And you notice the ending of verse 7, if you just drop down uh, at the end of verse 7, it says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, God's Son, cleanses us from all our sin. And so the word that I have upon my heart tonight is the word light. Dave spoke of darkness, and I'm going to try to, with God's help, bring forth the truth of light. We read in those words, that uh, in the, the word of God here, that the message we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I love the story Dave mentioned about the light in California, and I just forget the name of it. But what I took from it as he was speaking was that they are forgetting that the light is on. And at times, a believer and unbeliever alike forget that God is light, and they forget. And I do. I confess to you in full transparency and some vulnerability that I forget at times that God, when the word of God says God is light, it means that he is holy. He is separate from sin. God has never changed. And humanity changes, but God has never changed. As we take up the gospel here, just with given time, just remember this, that the gospel that we're speaking about, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not some political message with perhaps a hidden agenda in it. God puts his agenda right out in the open. And God is trying to communicate with you and with I. And yesterday we learned about one person, Christ, who died and rose again for all sinners. Today, we're learning about one person that individually can take God's free gift of salvation even today. If you were to look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, you'd understand that truth that the wages of our sin is death. But the gift that God offers for you today of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we view this darkness, we are reminded of Jesus as he told Nicodemus that as, Mo, as the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He continues to say those 25 words of absolute gospel power, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for darkness, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And as Jesus is going down John chapter 3, you hear these words uh, that Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He's reminding Nicodemus of this truth. And this is the condemnation, verse 19 of John 3, that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We touched on yesterday, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Just notice this. If you're on the call today and perhaps you're saying, well, I don't, I'm not that bad. Maybe you missed yesterday's call. And you're saying, ah, yeah, I might do some things that are a little wrong, but I'm not a, considered a sinner. When God says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he means this. For all, all or every. Have sin, it means to miss the mark, to do wrong or sin. Fallen short means to come late, to be behind, to come short of the glory, of the opinion of God, or the thought of God, or the, hence the praise, the honor, the glory of God and the Godhead. So the gospel, the good news, is about, as Dave opened already, men's darkness. And how that is, 1 John 1 and 7 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Light being the nature and character of God. So man needs to, their darkness, their sin, their death that comes as a result of sin, taken care for on a cross through one who is the light. If you look at darkness, you could turn to a cross and you'd see darkness. You'd see men's hatred on a cross. You'd see men's wickedness on a cross. You'd see the darkness of the heart of humanity, and it's all shown at Calvary. I love the hymn that says these words, it is finished. And just try to grasp yourself. Just maybe close your eyes if you want to, if you want to take your eyes off the speaker. But just think of these words, because I'm going to close with the last two verses of this particular hymn. It says this, there's a line that is drawn through the ages. And on that line stands an old rugged cross. And on that cross, a battle is raging to gain a man's soul or its loss. On one side, march the forces of evil, all the demons, the devils of hell. On the other, the angels of glory, and they meet on Golgotha's hill. The, the earth shakes with the force of the conflict, and the sun refuses to shine. You talk about darkness when God allowed the sun to refuse to shine, and his son paid for your sins and for my sins on a cross. For there hangs, as the hymn continues, God's son in the balance, and then through the darkness, he cries, it is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There'll be no more war. It is finished. The end of the conflict, it is finished. And Jesus is Lord. God is light. The absolute essence of Christian theology to the heathen, perhaps maybe listening on a call today, deity would have meant angry, malevolent beings 
Worship best by the secrecy of outrageous vice. To the Greeks and Romans, we touched on them just a little bit yesterday. Deity meant forces of nature transformed into superhuman men and women, powerful, impure. To the philosophers, maybe someone on the call today, you're saying, I'm a philosopher. An abstraction, either moral or physical. To the Gnostics, deity is a remote idea. Equal and contending forces of good and evil, only recognizable through less and less perfect deputies. John takes up and he sums up what the Old Testament and our Lord said about the Almighty Father in a swooping, simple declaration of truth that the youngest on the call today can come to understand and know as their sins are forgiven. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Our darkness needed to have someone who is perfect to pay for that darkness on a rugged cross. God is light. The light was God's garment. Notice Psalm chapter 104 and verse 2. And I, I'm using verses to share with you today. For As we reflect on God being light, it shows us really our darkness. Listen to these words. The Lord wraps himself. Psalm 104 and verse 2. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Ezekiel says that the appearance and glory of God like brightness came into his life. Habakkuk, his brightness, he says, was as light. He had never seen light like that before. Jesus, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them, again saying, I am the light of the world. Dave mentioned it, I believe. Jesus, as the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Bible teaches in 1 John chapter 1 that in him was no darkness at all. Very interesting. Uh, recently, Hudson, as we approached the church that we attended in Illinois, uh, the gospel hall out there, he mentioned as we drove into the driveway, uh, he said these words at random. Uh, we weren't really waiting for this. He just said, hey, guys, you know that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was just a, a young pup. He was probably, probably six at the time. And uh, and I remember thinking, sitting back, thinking, Man, six years old, and you understand that one truth, it's this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word had no sin. It was separate from sin. It was a holy person, the being of Christ. In the beginning, and Dave touched it. We haven't talked about what we're going to speak on as far as detail and material. But notice these words in Genesis chapter 1, because it says that God created light to dispel the darkness. And chaos, that's all over, the, all, all over the world. Then God creates lights in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And as light itself and the source of it, God only had to speak. And light came into being. Light that is of God. Notice one characteristic of it. It's the opposite of darkness that is evil. In his holiness, in God's righteousness, in his goodness, it's in contrast to the darkness of evil and sin. Light is a part of the essence of God. Never forget it. He is completely, unreservedly, absolutely holy with no sin, with no taint of iniquity, and not a hint. In a world that's filled with injustice, God, not a hint of injustice. Notice Jesus' birth, filled with light. I love the thoughts of this. Shepherds watching their flock at night, just doing what they're doing, waiting for the Messiah in absolute darkness. A picture of you and I walking through this earth in absolute darkness. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, hearts desperately wicked. Who can know them? And we're walking blinded by the God of this world. That's what the Bible teaches. And they're shepherds. They're watching their flock at night. And the word of God says this. An angel of the Lord stands before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. A most powerful piece of scripture. And they were greatly afraid. The glory of the Lord, the brightness of his person shone around them. And these words of the angel of the Lord says this to them as there they are afraid. But he says these words, I bring you, you know, the story, perhaps some of you celebrate Christmas. You remember the birth of Christ. You say, I bring you good tidings. He says of great joy, which will be to all the people for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, I can't imagine, darkness in the sky. And suddenly with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And in that moment, light came in and revealed things that were in darkness. Light reveals what's hidden in darkness. Our hidden sin, God's word reveals it. God as his person reveals it. Our hidden lifestyle, our thoughts, our heart, 
Our sin, perhaps ignored by man, but I will tell you carefully and with love tonight, God knows your sin. You know, I'm here in Arizona. I've been stuck here for the past 15 weeks. I say stuck. It's actually quite pleasant with all the sunshine. But I, I am here in a, the home that we're renting at night. We're known to have scorpions. I learned from my neighbor that if I take a black light and I walk at night when it's pitch black at night, but I shine this flashlight into the darkness, that flashlight reveals the dangers that are in this dark in that darkness. And you know what I see? Little scorpions that are great, quite dangerous. <laughs> the most poisonous in the world are right here in Phoenix. And they light up like a supernatural little critter. They light up bright green. They glow in the dark with light. Light, and I'm, I'm able to take care of them properly. Light illuminates what's in our backyard. Light, God's light illuminates what is in our heart, what is surrounded by the walls of pride. God comes in and says, listen, our sin has been revealed. Our sin can never enter heaven. And Christ, the just one, died for us, the unjust, to pay for our sin, to provide the forgiveness of sins. And he did that just for you. And the light of the gospel comes in and it reveals men's heart. It reveals darkness. As humanity, we don't like to hear of our shortcomings. We don't like to hear of our blind spots. Very interesting, though, when a blind spot is revealed corporately, as some of you are perhaps corporate executives or uh, corporate directors or whatever the case may be on the call. But as a blind spot is revealed, we almost welcome it because we can learn from it and become better. Interesting, when you look at friendships, uh, perhaps when friendships are speaking and they reveal a truth, it might damage the friendship. But a true friendship stays together. God wants a relationship with you, and he shows us our shortcomings. He says, you've sinned, and I'm holy. He says, you've sinned and my Christ has not sinned. My son has not sinned, but he paid for your sins on a cross. And God is saying in the darkness that men love their sin and he reveals man their sin. Yet he also shows them a, a way of redemption. And that's through the person of Christ. So remember at Jesus' birth, it was filled with light. But notice Jesus' death as time is just passing. Jesus' death filled with darkness. The one who brought light was covered in darkness luke chapter 23 and verse 44 says now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour and through that darkness christ cries father into your hands i commend my spirit and jesus gave his life men never took his life the christ gave his life on behalf of you tonight on the call there in the darkness shouts of the cross crucify him you want to see darkness spittle at the cross you want to see darkness the song of the drunkard at the cross when we look at darkness at the cross we see the slapping of christ's face on the cross the creation slapping the creator we see the scourging of men at the cross we see the submission of christ to his father on account of you and i on a cross we see the silence of the angels who would have praised him for all of eternity past yet they're silent on the cross we see the savior's cry at the cross and perhaps some of you have come to trust in that cry it is finished notice when he rises from the dead jesus came he lived he died he was buried and he rose again the resurrection of jesus christ without it we have no gospel we have no hope we have no peace notice matthew chapter 28 it says mary magdalene and the other mary come to see the tomb jesus has been buried for three days it says and behold there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and he sat on it. And now see where there's filled with light at his, as, at his resurrection. His countenance or his being was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. You know why Jesus came? John chapter 10 verse 10 says this. The thief comes not except to steal and to kill. That's why the enemy is here and to destroy. Jesus says, I am come that they might have life. He accomplished that through his life, death, his burial, and his resurrection. And they that have it more abundantly, I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Not a wonder, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 52. Some of you have been saved through these words. Surely he, Christ, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we, the sinner, esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he, Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes... We are healed. All we like sheep, we've gone astray in our sin. We've turned everyone to his own way. And I'm thankful today as we consider what Isaiah wrote hundreds of years before Christ ever came. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a savior. One dying for all. Light coming to save those from darkness. I mentioned as I close, I was going to finish with the last two verses of It Is Finished. Listen carefully as the writer continues. Yet in my heart, he says, the battle was still raging. Not all prisoners of war had come home. Is there someone on the call today and you're struggling with sin? Maybe enslaved to your sin. 
There's something, there's prisoners, they, they've got, and, they're, and you're captivated by your sin. He says, these were battlefields of my own making. I didn't know that the war had been won. Oh, but then I heard the king of the ages, light, the person of Christ, had fought all the battles for me. And that victory was mine for the claiming. And now, praise his name, I am free. Isn't that nice? The darkness is over. The light reveals our condition compared to his holiness and our need of a savior. And with our dark hearts, we turn to the place called Calvary. And for the first time in our life, we understand Jesus Christ died for me. And today on the call, you could sing tonight. And now praise his name. I am free. Free from the bondage of sin. Free from ever paying for sin. Free from ever uh, perishing in your sins. You can be bound for heaven, not because of what I said or David said, just simply because of what the word of God says. I remember these words that we said, that we spoke about tonight, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Come to trust it tonight and know your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. I'm going to make a couple of announcements after. And thanks again for being with us.